All right, here we are. So we learn uh, and that this creator, white magician, uh, <coughs> holds the thought form in his consciousness and gives it shape and energy through the power of his one-pointed mental focus. Okay. All right. We are told in the rule under consideration that the aspirant has three things to do. One, ascertain the formula which will crystallize the form he has built, much in the same way that we find architects and bridge builders reducing the desired form to a mathematical formula. Two, pronounce certain words which will give the form vitality, and so carry it forth onto the physical plane. Three, Utter the phrase which will detach the thought form from its aura and so save the drain upon his energy. Okay. Detach the thought form from his aura. Now, you know, we have to ask to what degree is it in his aura and to what degree within his auric influence because already, already on the mental plane or with the mental plane formulas, he has um, driven the thought form from him. So is it in his aura or is it within the general influence of his aura? The uh, thought form from him. In other words, right here in rule four on the mental plane, the man breathes deeply, he concentrates his forces and drives the thought form from him, way back in rule four. So, has he driven it forth, but still within the range of his aura? And because here it seems that it is in his aura, in the emotional area, and it has to be detached from the aura. So maybe there are like, um, maybe there are like three positions. Uh, deeply within him and then within the periphery of his aura and then detached from his aura. DK is not being too specific about this but obviously if he breathes deeply and drives the thought form from him it's going to be driven forth to a less central position than it was when it began so he can focus contemplatively upon it and the heart, the throat and the eye be used to create vitalization of the thought form and protection with these air atoms uh, protection from his thought form and protection uh, from the devas that could reinvade him so I guess when I'm looking at how many positions are there once he drives the thought form from him in rule two. In rule four. four. Okay, let's go back and take a look here. Ascertain the formula which will crystallize the form he has built. So it, it renders it, um, should we say, stable uh, and uh, more enduring and less fluid and uh, able to survive on its own right. Much in the same ways we find architects and bridge builders reducing the desired form to a mathematical formula. Well, crystallizing looks like one thing, but there is a formula which will crystallize. So. What does this formula consist of? The formula is probably a mantra. Ascertain the formula which will crystal... It, it, uh, it seems to me that uh, it has to be expressed in some way and word is the probable means of an expression. 
of its expression. Can be. The, the, the mathematical formula mm-hmm. and the mathematical formula is not the same. Well, as I remember, it tells us in. Okay, the question is, see, some formulas, yeah, some form. no, he does say someplace, here's what he said, this is what he said, scientific formulas will be reduced to sound. Now, I agree with you that it's possible to have a formula on paper and a mantra which are different things, but somewhere he does say, see if we can find, find this, I'm just trying to think about how, what would you be able to do, how would you use a formula to crystallize your thought form? What would you do? Okay. After all, uh, after all, scientific formulas have reduced the most intricate and abstruse discoveries to a few signs and symbols. The next step is to embody these signs and symbols into a word or words, thus imparting to them what is esoterically called the power of embodiment. This sounds, you know, like what we're discussing. Uh, if I were to express it this way, the ancient statement that God spoke and the worlds were made simply means that God's formula for creation was reduced to a great word which he sounded forth and the inevitable result followed. So at least we do know one thing, that a formula can be reduced to word or sound. That much it can be. But I know the section you're talking about where he... Um, yes, he, he talks about the first and the second and the third aspect. Yeah, but he. He said that the the the, the soul form don't have a soul. Thought form <coughs> don't have a soul. Did you say? We 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 we, have, we were not connecting the soul form to the soul in itself. An entity. We are talking about an entity. Well, I'm uh, right now. What I'm trying to focus on is the idea of what the magician has to do to ascertain the formula which will confine the, in, the lives within the ensphering wall. I think there, he has to work with the third aspect alone. And yeah. The second and man's and sound is connected to the second aspect. Um, yes, and also to the throat center and the third aspect. There's that thing under the Deva kingdom where he talks about the transmitting and the mantra and the formula. Maybe you can find it. But... Yes, it Ten seventy one. Because in this in this case, you know, it's quite possible to somehow he's got to do something with a formula which will crystallize his thought form. Something has to be done. So what does he do? And you know, to me, I think that using some kind of word, okay, um, in a treatise on cosmic fire ten seventy one. Did you say 1071? He said, he calls it a mathematical formula also at page 771. 771. 771. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. There is three points in the middle of the page. Yeah, yeah. right. The word of power, the mantra combination, and the mathematical formula. Yeah, well, I think, I think that what he's doing here is as, as we just read in Destiny of the Nations, that he's taking a formula and making, giving it the power of embodiment. That's what T.K. just said. You can have all this mathematics and then you reduce it to sound or word. So I, uh, I do believe that there will be um, some kind of sound operating here in order to make this happen. You know, the one that I just read, um, let's see, right over here okay so it's destiny of the nations I don't know if I can refine it again I hope I can the destiny okay so uh, formula okay well that ought to do it 
algebraic formula or formulas. No. And sound. Formulas sound. That's what I want. Form formulas formulas well there's only one place where formulas is given ah yeah uh, so let's just say that these mathematical formulas which may be the same as scientific formulas have reduced the most intricate and abstruse discoveries to a few signs and symbols the next step is to embody these signs and symbols into a word or words thus imparting to them what is esoterically called the power of embodiment. So let's just suppose we have a formula for confining the lives in the ensphering wall. If we can also reduce the, this formula to words, we can pronounce certain words which will do that job. Because otherwise, they wouldn't, otherwise what's on paper wouldn't have the power of embodiment. It couldn't be made active. So anyway, this is a possibility. And I think it's actually worth uh, copying. <laughs> Whatever page it's on. Page 131. Mathematical formulas. So it's uh, D-O-N-1... Did I say 131 or 141? Does anybody remember? <laughs> I don't. 131. 131 formulas into sound formulas into word and sound power of embodiment embodiment okay all right <coughs> it is interesting about mantras because as you say you know um, they are connected with the second aspect and at the same time um, they require the throat center and sound in order to become effective. So, um, and, and, and we know that the throat center is ruled by the third ray and by the seventh ray, in other words, by the third aspect. So, when I think about mantrams, um, they have qualities of both those aspects. I think we have to investigate this. Okay, so the first thing to be done, <coughs> what is the formula, and get that formula to work, confine the lives, confine the lives. The next thing, pronounce words of power which are, as you said, on the first aspect, and yet we're still using the we're still using what you would call the throat center to do it, interestingly enough. Okay, um, words of power on the first aspect. On the first aspect. Okay. And then, which will give the form vitality, and that fits, so as to carry it forth onto the physical plane. In other words, <coughs> uh, it must have vigor, strength, vitality to carry uh, it to the etheric physical plane. And the last thing, again, the throat is involved, the detaching mantram or what can we call it, mystic phrase. Okay. It will be noted that the formula has relation to the thought form, the words of power to the objective for which the form has been constructed. In other words, it's, um, what should we call it? It's destination. And the mystic phrase concerns the severing of the magnetic link. So, formula, word of power, and mystic phrase. Let's just put those three ideas down. Formula, word of power, mystic phrase. 
the destiny, the destination, carry it where it's supposed to go. So, and probably they each connect to one of the aspects of divinity. Maybe we could say, as you said, that the formula relates to ray 3, the word of power to ray 1, although there's a problem there, because the mystic phrase should also be ray 1, because it cuts. You know. So, um, maybe the formula, if rendered into word, contains ray 2 also. Okay. One, therefore, concerns the form, the thought form. In other words, the lesser builders, let the lesser builders cease from their labors. Another, the soul of the form, which, whose lowest characteristic is desire, the reflection of love, and the last, the life aspect, with which the Creator has endowed the creation. But he didn't give this in order. This is not given in order. Okay? Uh, these three are not given in order. Because the word of power, as I recall, has the life aspect in it. Right? Pronounce the words which will give the form vitality. That's the life aspect. So he changed the order in which he gave these. <clears throat> the formula has relation to the thought form. Okay, so here we are a little further down. One, therefore, con concerns the form, and that is, i.e., the formula. Another, the soul embodied in the form, whose lowest characteristic is desire, and the last, and which is that, do you think? What concerns the soul embodied in the form? It's not the last one, because the mystic phrase is what cuts it free. So this is not really easy to understand. <clears throat> and the last, with which the life aspect. So I think this should be the word of power, which vitalizes the form and sends it on its destiny. And all you're left with then is the possibility of severing. So there's not a complete matching up here, unfortunately. <clears throat> we are consequently face to face again with the eternal triplicities of spirit, soul, and body. It should be remembered that the rules for magic, as understood by the true esotericist, are as true of a created universe, solar system, or planet as they are true of the tiny creations of a chela or aspirant. I think um, I'm not going to belabor the point. I think we understand up here at least what's going on. There is a formula and it solidifies the form crystallizes it there is a word of power pronounce the words which will tell them what to do and where to carry that which has been made that's so ray one go here do this this is your direction and here's the vitality to do it that's ray one but the last bit utter the phrase which will detach the thought form from his aura. Can we connect that with Ray 2? I don't know. Detachment is about Ray 1. All right. Another, the soul and body in the form. I'll have to really dwell on that, and maybe you can as well. Now I'm going to go to our next. I'm going to go down to the next thing here. Okay. Okay, there we are. Uh, would you read this, Gisela, please? 
this life principle, this basic essential of being, and this mysterious elusive factor is the correspondence in man of that which we call spirit or life in the macrocosm. Just as the life in man holds together, animates, vitalizes, and drives into activity the form, and so makes of him a living being, so the life of God, as the Christian calls it, performs the same purpose in the universe and produces that coherent, living, vital ensemble which we call the solar system. This is so, so interesting um, to call the solar system a vital ensemble. The word ensemble in English means together. It reflects the French word ensemble, which means together. So it's a living togetherness is what this is. Living togetherness called a solar system. Okay? I've I've skipped a few things here because... um, Well, I just, I just had to. It's just too much. Yeah, this is all about organic and inorganic science and all the rest of it. But we want to get back to the life aspect. This cohe- the cohesive vitalizing force is gone, and this produces that falling apart of the essential elements which has been regarded as the body. So he's speaking of um, vitality and death death and vitality which which inevitably goes along with magic because whatever aggregates must become de-aggregated whatever comes together must go apart okay go ahead this life principle in man manifests in a triple manner one as the directional will purpose basic incentive This is the dynamic energy which sets the being functioning, brings him into existence, sets the term of his life, carries him through the years, long or short, and abstracts itself at the close of his life cycle. Okay, so this energy enters and withdraws. You have appearance and death. By by its entering, see, um, by its entering and withdrawing, you have emergence and death. Okay, go ahead. This is the spirit in man manifesting as the will to live, to be, to act, to pursue, to evolve. In its lowest aspect, this works through the mental body or nature, and in connection with the dense physical, makes itself (coughs) felt through the brain. So this is the will aspect, the life principle manifesting first through will. Among the lower vehicles, the mental body represents it. Within the physical body itself, taken as a whole, the brain represents it the factor which directs the whole process, okay? Now this life principle manifests secondly as... The coherent force. It is that significant essential quality which makes each man different, which produces that complex manifestation of moods, desires, qualities, complexes, inhibitions, feelings and characteristics which produce a man's peculiar psychology. This is the result of the interplay between the spirit or energy aspect and the matter or body nature. This is the distinctive subjective man, his coloring or individual note. This it is this it is which sets the rate of vibratory activity of his body produces his particular type of form, is responsible for the condition and nature of his organs, his glands, and his outer aspect. This is the soul, and in his lowest aspect, it works through the emotional or or astral nature, and in connection with the dense physical through the heart. Okay, we're being given the correspondences of the aspects to the... Uh, 
vehicles of the personality and then we go to the body and what are the correspondences within the body itself. So first we had spirit, its correspondence was the mind and the brain. Okay, so let's just make a tabulation here. First we had spirit, then <clears throat> mind, then brain. Now we have soul, astral body, heart. Does anybody, what do you think will come next? <laughs> I suppose personality, physical body, and what? Do you think, what? Lungs, throat? <laughs> Some kind of um, organ will come next. Let's just see what it's going to be. And next, the life principle works out as the activity of the atoms and cells of which the physical body is composed. It is the sum total of those little lives of which the human organs comprising the entire man are composed. These have their life of their own and a consciousness which is strictly individual and identified. Now, that's interesting. Usually, individuality is reserved for self-conscious being. Here the term individual is applied to the tiny little cell lives uh, within our physical body. Okay. This, yeah. This aspect of the life principle works through the etheric or vital body and in connection with the solid mechanism of the tangible form through the spleen. Aha. Uh -huh. Maybe we wouldn't have expected that except to have read ahead. <laughs> okay. So, and this is the, um, I suppose it's the personality, and I suppose this is the physical body, and somewhere in here, uh, the life of all cells. Yeah. Life of all cells in the physical body. Right, which makes activity movement possible. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, let's put that down. And via the spleen, vitality is drawn into the uh, etheric body, or the splenic center anyway. Vitality is brought, drawn into the physical, the etheric body, and distributed to the physical body, <coughs> making movement and activity possible. Okay, this is activity and the atoms and cells which the physical body is composed. Now, I suppose <coughs> also here, personality. Uh, yes, and physical body. He doesn't really discuss the personality so much, but it is the lower correspondence once you start with spirit, soul, although we might also call this body, like that. Because sometimes personality and body are given an equivalent um, definition. All right, so this is the first, second, and third aspect. Driving forward coherence and activity and uh, when you think of when you think when you think of the second the second one of these boy oh boy what's going on here there's something that occurred to me when he described all the things that the soul aspect does to make you distinct and individual and it came to me and and it probably came to you that the soul is the quality of life. That is repeated all through Esoteric Psychology 1. As spirit, we are all the same, but the distinctiveness, our individuality, 
which is our quality, is the sole characteristic. And that gives us our fundamental geometrical qualitative arrangement. Arrangement. He, let's just read again what he says about it. <clears throat> There's something that is the coherent force it's a significant, essential quality which makes every man different. So it's our rays, our astrology, our, the aspect that we represent which produces that complex manifestation of moods, desires, qualities, complexes, inhibitions, feelings, all of these coming from our psychological life. All of these coming from the subtle bodies and determining our psychological life. Which page is it again? Uh, 400, where are we? 470? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll make it... Um, 473? Okay, and this is the result of spirit and enter, uh, uh, interplaying with matter or body the distinctive subjective man this is this, this these are the important phrases the distinctive subjective man his coloring or individual note and this is the quality this is the second aspect this is how we are all different from each other qualitatively how we are all different from each other qualitatively okay and uh, our, our distinctive individual arrangement is very uh, Leo Aries, Leo, Sagittarius this is the soul and in its lowest aspect it works through the emotional or astral nature and in the dense physical through the heart okay and then activity and the spleen alright the next section it is not, of course, possible to give the magic words and phrases which are mentioned in Rule 11. They would be profoundly incomprehensible to all but the initiate, and therefore need not engross our attention. It should be noted that much in these instructions is an advance of modern thought, and both these instructions and the treatise on cosmic fire will only be fully understood towards the end of this century. Shall we pause on that? <laughs> so it should be understood now. Absolutely. Full and fully understood. Because the end of the century has passed. So, what happened? Well, DK sees <laughs> the progress which has been taking place. He, do you see he what? He misconceives. You, meaning that he anticipated more progress than really took place. But his judgment is false. Yes. <laughs> so he is false. <laughs> there you go. This, this, is, this is so important. I, I, I told Finn that I was arranging a meeting between him and DK for him to take up all his complaints. And now I arrange a meeting for you. And, and look, and as you enter the room, please use just the words you did. You can begin with your judgment is false. I think. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to make this just. I don't understand. Why is she saying that during the World War II, the prophet was very strong? Why did he not know that the prophet was faster than the Yeah. I think. We're making a lot of progress, but you know, I believe that Master DK and certain other masters intended to externalize in the 1950s and 60s. And that the Christ himself intended to externalize before the conclusion of the last century. And had that been the case, all that is here predicted would surely have unfolded. But then, those, that's what the early books said, before the end of the century. 
Uh, that, that's actually... Then came atomic energy. Before the end of the century. Serious disturbances may be looked for in California before the end of the century. And in Alaska also. Um, and or maybe and maybe I can say by the end of the century by the end of the century no, by the end of this century anyway it, uh, um, it will have run its rightful place well the, the Christ was due to appear I think it said in Initiation Human and Solar one of the early books by the end of the century and maybe even toward the middle of the century and that was being written in 1920 only one world war had been foreseen not the second and no atomic bomb and I think there was a regrouping uh, a, a, a readjustment of the plan to prevent humanity from destroying itself and I think certain things had to be hastened and other things had to be pulled back. Uh, and I think the hint is given in the idea that atomic energy was not to be discovered until the age of Capricorn. Now, what a different world they, uh, that would have been. No atomic bomb or something of that nature before the year 4,000-something uh, AD. But the fifth ray ashram was so incredibly brilliant and willful, acting under the necessary, uh, under necessity, because of the attack of the Black Lodge, that it penetrated into the mysteries and brought something through 2,000 years early. And when you introduce the X factor 2,000 years early, everything changes. And that is my impression of why it, that we would we did not have or would not have the Christ before the end of the 20th century I'm going to look up the word century uh, maybe I will find what I'm looking for but it's a very shocking thing because if the Christ was going to appear by the middle of the last century or its end what about the masters who have to precede him so I almost think that D.K. was setting up his ashram in New York intending to come out and take external control over it in the middle of the last century. This is my thought. Um, here we go. Initiation Human and Solar, page 60 and 61. Certain facts concerning these masters and their work in the present and in the future may be in place here. First, the work of training their pupils and disciples to fit them to be of use in two great events. One, the coming of the world teacher towards the middle or close of this present century. And the other, the training of them to be of use in the founding of the new six subrace and in the reconstruction for the present world conditions written in 1920 21, 22 so there it is so how do you perceive the progress now then? well it's pretty good in every place except Norway <laughs> <laughs> what are their changed plans? I believe that um, at the what I read the other night at the um, lecture about the great wave of expectation after the masters had established themselves in the five planetary centers and after the governments of the world would look eagerly towards the opinion of the masters and their disciples in all governmental uh, deliberations that that's what's coming following 2025 the setting up of hierarchical outposts in the five planetary centers and the ingathering of disciples around those outposts and the influencing of nations 
from those outposts which will set up the expectation for the reappearance for the coming of the Christ I think that's the next um, move and I think (coughs) well you know we're told that only once the sharing the peace and the house cleaning has taken place that any of this can happen so the time equation is not decided but I think that somewhere in the 21st century the masters will become well known externally and that so called according to HPB occultism will have won the day by the end of the 21st century that was her prediction and the high reputation of the masters and their disciples in the later 21st century will set up the possibility of the return of the Christ just as the Piscean influence is going out in the 21st century he says by the end of the uh, he says it will disappear in the end in the 21st century I think I can find that one quickly um, Piscean uh, disappear there's only one uh, but it's not there <laughs> uh, the Piscean influence, let's see maybe he means fade out, okay Piscean influence um, century let's see what that says next century when the seventh ray has achieved complete manifestation and the Piscean influence is entirely removed the seventh ray avatar will appear now again we have to see when this is written Um, it may be one of the early writings but he but you know those kinds of things are not in DK's or man's control the appearance or disappearance of the Piscean influence is just cyclic law no this is 1941 so already the atomic bomb is in the works the Manhattan Project is going pretty much so the disappearance of the Piscean influence in the 21st century is cyclic law and the seventh ray and the sixth ray will not have entirely disappeared but I believe that this that the Christ the first the, the, I believe that the 21st century is the century for the emergence of the masters in recognizability at least as great people with a bri- with a brilliant following at least that much and then depending on how well they do the 21st century may be the time for the appearance of the Christ or the following not too long after uh, what I think will happen is that humanity will get itself into such a crisis that what seemed like it would take a very long time to make humanity responsive to these kinds of possibilities will happen much sooner because humanity will be desperate for solutions and the hierarchy will be able to offer such solutions through its leading intelligent disciples who will say look we have to try this and they will be attended to so whereas before the year 2025 I don't think we're going to see the Christ as in the saying that every eye shall see him I don't think so but I think we will get a very steady drumbeat for the conditions that inform humanity sufficiently so that the masters can come out and that's where our job comes in to inform humanity sufficiently about the true existence of the masters so that they can be intelligently accepted when they begin to move out and you can be sure that Master DK 
is going to be one of those who moves out because he's so mercury he's so close to physicality much more so than master kh and even once master kh was with us so dk will be with us master r again i believe will be with us as the seventh ray avatar actually on the physical plane all right these are predictions but you know in the morning meditation when thinking about resurrection I got the feeling again of what wonderful things really are possible and much closer to happening than we may think when we get our consciousness all stuck in the immediate problems I, because I was given advice or you know my own inner sense of things told me that I should stop concentrating so much on the problems and more on the possibilities I think it's closer than we think. I don't want to be Pollyanna about this pie in the sky, but I do think that, you know, they say, well, why did you hit the mule over the head with a two-by-four? And the answer comes, to get his attention. And humanity has to be hit over the head with something to get its attention. I think that's coming. All right. <laughs> I think that um, the, the um, uh, catastrophes in nature and, and uh, the economic uh, problems that you have all over the world. That's it. I think that the divine is getting our attention mm -hmm. right now, and I think it gets worse and worse and worse <clears throat> until drastic revolutionary solutions are the only ones which will solve the situation and then we begin to look for those who have the solutions very very good ones and we would not have listened to them before these catastrophes in other words uh, you know how it is even people here they come to this clinic after they've tried everything conventional medicine cannot help them so then what they're open to a possibility they may never have thought of before I think that's the same case with humanity coming okay let us consider this sentence by sentence um, go ahead and arrive at the one of the interpretations which is the easiest for the average aspirant all these rules can be read from the standpoint of intelligent man and will mean but little. They can be read from the standpoint of the aspirant and will then convey certain practical ideas which are susceptible of daily application and can be brought out in the crucible of life experience. They will achieve meaning as the aspirant learns to handle energies, to work in mental matter and to cooperate creatively with the purpose underlying the evolutionary plan. From the angle of the vision of the disciple, these rules carry certain potent instructions and will lead him to an understanding of the process of the creative work in nature which is necessarily sealed to the mind of the aspirant. Let's pause just for a minute because he makes quite a distinction here between how the aspirant will interpret the rules and how disciples will. Uh, according to the way we are reading and thinking, are we interpreting these rules as aspirants or as disciples? What do you think? <laughs> in between that's a safe place to be let me tell you <laughs> well I think we are getting into it a bit deeper and looking at some of the uh, instructions as to what specifically we are to do and our own wider reading of the teaching has helped us bring in other thoughts that the aspirant might not be able to see so hopefully these things are serving us as we apply them in meditation as instructions hopefully but um, we still know as we read how much we don't know 
you know, much is still obscure to us, but at least we're getting the idea of how we can conduct ourselves to become creative in the divine sense. So, a little bit of the disciplic reading, I think, is coming in, in at this moment. Okay. As to the comprehension of the initiate, these words convey definite commands which only his illumined intuition can rightly interpret. Hmm. With the higher grades of intelligences, we need not concern ourselves. We will consider this rule, therefore, solely from the angle of vision of the average aspirant, leaving other interpretations to those individuals who have the internal equipment which will enable them to understand. Because even, um, let's just say, even the higher beings express these rules in their creativity. But of course it would be worded differently for them. In other words, a, a planetary logos or a solar logos will go through an analogous process, but he's saying, look, we don't have to worry about that. We just need to make these things practical, a little bit practical for ourselves. That was the attitude of the aspirant, right? Certain practical ideas which are susceptible of daily application and can be wrought out in the crucible of life experience. So this is a most practical book, even though it's tough. And as, as you would expect it to be, because it's a seventh ray book, I mean, it's a book in which the seventh ray plays a very big role, and that is the most practical ray. You know, just get it down onto the physical plane and make it happen. All right, so the first, we review the formulas now, ascertain. Ascertain the formula which will confine the lives within the ensphering wall. Right, ensphering means there's a, there's a wall, there's a sphere around these lives which holds them in. So, in a, in a very fluid uh, astral form, these lives might just not hang together without the real close attention of the Creator. But now we can perform, we can pronounce some sort of uh, uh, vocal formula which will actually create a ring pass knot for these lives that they cannot go beyond and they will be held within this ring pass knot until the form completes its task or falls apart for some other reason. All forms in nature as we well know are made up of myriads, myriads of tiny lives holding a certain measure of awareness, of rhythm, and of coherency, according to the force of the law of attraction, utilized by the builder of the form. This is true both of the macrocosm and of the infinite world of microcosmic lives, which are contained within the greater whole. Embryo, solar systems coming into being under the impulse of divine thought are at first fluidic and nebulous, are shifting in outline and are held together loosely by the central nucleus of energy, another way of expressing the embodied idea. So just so this is describing the condition of our thought form before the formula is rendered into word. Uh, fluidic and nebulous. And, and 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 this is interesting, the word shifting in outline. Meaning when you look at it, you know, the, the shape of it keeps changing because it's unstable. And what we're trying to do is stabilize the shape of the thought form that we are creating. Okay, shifting an outline. I think that describes it well. Go ahead. As time progresses, they <coughs> pass on to other conditions. They take more definite form. <coughs> They enter into peculiar relations with allied and neighboring forms and adjust themselves to varying relations of an internal nature with those forms which in the earlier stage was not possible. Okay, so a solidification is occurring. 
relationship with other forms in the environment and also within themselves there are all kinds of adjustments going on and these are also routined or solidified or made rhythmic uh, consolidation, solidation, crystallization the idea of uh, a stable, rhythmic interplay within and without and that is a normal process of the life development from from vague and nebulous to more and more definite okay eventually we find a solar system such as ours and myriads of others a solar system functioning as the sun with its revolving and rotating planets preserving their differing orbits holding their stated and relative positions active as independent and interdependent organisms and yet presenting to the eye of the astronomer a coherence mm -hmm. a unity and a structure that is unique in each case and yet which functions under cosmic law yeah so that you know when DK wants to put thoughts together synthetically he gets these marvelous sentences so this gives us the picture of the coherence of any precipitated form uh, and the way it holds its position. So the, he's explaining how a stability has come through consolidation and uh, internal positions are now held in a stable manner. Okay. It measures up to some vast purpose conceived and held steadily in the universal mind, which is in its turn an aspect of that group conscious and self-conscious entity who is the author of its being and the creator of its form. Okay. Um, the author of its being, yeah. Okay, so a form measures up to a conception. That's basically what he's saying all uh, all uh, forms which uh, appear through a, a purposeful action of an entity measure up to the conception of that entity let's see uh, which uh, rightly appear because a lot of times I suppose you could say that you know we the, the author of a creation fails somehow in the creative process but if all is going well then the form will rightly represent the purpose of the creator and entity I do that sometimes you know I say uh, entity I give an E slash and a little E because to represent the scale here of great beings and lesser beings this is the African version of the word entity <laughs> okay this one intelligent life may be posited as creating in his meditation or it's if you prefer for what do words matter when all is futile <laughs> to express reality as it is and consequently in his reflecting mind that which we call a thought form this thought form has four main characteristics. One, it is brought into being through the conscious use of the law of attraction. Do we understand why that is so? How do we say that a thought form is brought into being through the conscious use of the law of attraction? How, uh, think about the creative process as we understand it now the solar angel collects himself, scatters not his force but in meditation deep communicates with his reflection when the shadow hath responded in meditation deep the work uh, proceedeth etc the lower light, the greater light, blah 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 the energy circulates 
the, the myriads gather round uh, the point of light, the product of the labors of the four, waxeth and groweth. The myriads gather round its glowing warmth until its light recedes, its fire grows dim. Where is the law of attraction in that? Is it? Is there a law of attraction in making that form? Yeah, the myriads gather round its glowing warmth. Here comes the stuff to make the thought form, right? So this little point of light is magnetic and attracts under the law of attraction that which is the Davic life which is needed to give it substance. Okay, so uh, the myriads myriads gather round. Okay. It is formed of an infinite number of living entities who are attracted by the mind of the divine creator and thus enter into relation with each other. Okay, so remember this part. Then shall the second sound go forth. The creator below is reinforcing the magnetic power of his thought form. The creator above continues to uh, sustain the magnetism of the form. That's the solar angel continues to do this of the form. Okay. An infinite number of living entities who are attracted by the mind of the divine creator and that's the solar angel in our case. Okay? The form is the externalization of something that its creator has. And has, and what has he done? He has visualized, built intelligently and colored or qualified so as to meet the purpose for which it was intended, vitalized by the potency of his desire and the strength of his living thought. So just pause there and realize that vitalization comes, I'll, I'll correct it, in through at least two sources, the mind being one, not the astral body alone. See how that works? In other words, we sometimes say, well, the vital power shall be sought. But is there vitality being added on the mental plane to the thought form? Yes. Yes. This thing being created, the form, is being vitalized by the vital, by the living thought of the creator and not only by his desire. So, you know, the little pieces drop into place as we continue studying. Vitalization arises through living thought on the mental plane and through intensifying desire. Okay, this thought form is? Held in shape as long as it is needed in order to perform its specific work. Okay connected to himself by a magnetic thread, the thread of his living purpose and the strength of his dominant will. Okay, so now we have to ask, depending upon the Creator, after the Creator uh, uh, severs the relation between himself and his creation, is it still bound to himself by a magnetic thread? Which I think, you know, is an interesting question. He may sever it so it can't come right back, but is there something there that still connects the Creator with his creation? Or is it just really out there on its own, having no more connection to him. So let's see what we've been doing so far. We've been saying the form is an externalization of something that the Creator has. 
He's first visualized and colored it, painted it, vitalized it, held it in, uh, held it in shape as long as is needed. So it, it sounds like the Creator has a relationship to the form when it's out there performing. This sounds like the Creator is still related to the form even once it is out there performing. That's what it sounds like here. And we talked about that the other day. There's degrees of this. When you finish with your product, you may let it go. But if you're a composer, let's say, who's still alive, even though other people are supporting your what your creation has been, your symphony, your sonata, whatever, there's still that link between you. And even after you're dead, who knows, there may still be a link to, to your creation. And then, so it's connected by a magnetic thread, and we have to understand um, that the creation may be rather independent uh, no, in, in, independent, sorry, out there, but there may still be the magnetic link. Okay, so then we go to the fourth point. This interior purpose, which has coded itself in mental, astral, and vital substance, is potent on the physical plane just as long as A. It remains consciously in its creator's thought. Okay, and again we have to say up to a point. Okay. B. It keeps its distance occultly from its creator. Many thought forms remain futile as they are too close to their creator. There's such practical advice here. This is just incredible stuff. Okay, go ahead. C. It can be directed in any desired direction and under the law of least resistance can find its own place, thus performing its desired function and carrying out the purpose for which it was created. Okay. Okay, it has... Um, see, the point number A, I think this is a relative statement. Because... You know, like, let's just say, if you are consciously working with something you have conceived, you know, like, let's say, you build a business or a company, and you are the director, you are uh, working with your form. But some creations are finished products, and are put forth into the world to uh, survive as they can. And you do not do anything. In other words, I keep on coming back to musical analogies because it's what I know. If I write something and it's out there for 100 or 200 or 500 people, I don't have to run around all the time and say, will you play this in your symphony? Will you play this on your radio? Will you do this, you do that? It, it has its own thing. So, I am not in charge of the fate of that creation. Although, every once in a while, I might stimulate it. But if I create a business or a company, like let's say Steve Jobs created Apple, and he's in charge of Apple. And what he created, he continues to supervise and manage. Now, that's a, that's a different relationship. And therefore, Apple will stay together as long as it remains in his thought or in, his, or in the thought of his substitute who comes after him and after him because it needs a manager. No company is going to run on its own, whereas a work of art might very well do so. Yes? Uh, I think it depends on the preparation or the, the uniqueness of the product. Because you could say, if it's so well prepared, 
So it will be so another person can take it over. It's yeah. there. And if it, it you know the future has been put into the product, it will stay alive. And yes. what you say with music, if the quality is so unique, it will survive. Yes, yes, uh, it needs to be revitalized by people saying, okay, I will play this on my CD player, or I will conduct this in my... You know, in other words, it requires, but at least it holds its own integrity. But with a company, depending upon the constant energy input of employees and managers and all the rest of it, it needs to be sustained because it's so complex. But, but I could give, give an example. I created a department in IBM. Right. Which was not there before. And, and we created a, 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 what you call an extranet. A, a what? An extranet. Extranet. Which was before internet. Oh. Internally within IBM. Okay. And we created, you could say, it was organized yeah. in a way so it could fit the future. Okay. And it's still alive. It's still alive. And, and left. Okay, that, and that's excellent because it shows a, a degree of preparation. Yet, this idea needs to be sustained by managerial and employment energy, doesn't it? But it was so good, so everybody said, we don't need to, to develop another no. party. No new form, mm -hmm. just maintenance energy. Yes. Okay. But does, yes. Doesn't it come down to the point where um, this is the creative part yes. of the thing, yes. and then the creator has to uh, uh, let it go? Yes. And then somebody else takes over. Yes. And, and then it is uh, the other responsibility uh, whether it is going to live on. Yes. yes. Some supportive energy is needed. Mm. It does not have to be the energy of the original creator. Mm. But if I have Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, it's great. But if it's not played on a CD or by an orchestra, then it's it's not alive. It's just waiting to be vitalized. But you could also say if it's not converted to a CD, if it's still sitting on an old... If it's sitting on what? Sitting on an old play, what do you call it? A uh, record player. Yes. Yeah. You have to find, you maintain it. Yeah, you have to keep upgrading the media by which yes. it is presented. Yes. Okay, you know, the magical process is very... Um, it's very practical business. So we will, after lunch, we will continue uh, to do this. And I think, you know, before we leave today, we will have a little meditation downstairs. Uh, it will not be musical meditation, just short wrap-up. Maybe just 15 or 20 minutes or whatever. Uh, I regret that I have lost my voice. Uh, it is coming back now, though, so I could have you sing those songs. However... <laughs> We'll uh, come back at uh, an hour and 15 minutes at 2 o'clock. Okay. Thank you.